just take care of that and let me get uh, this one on to that side. There we go. Cool. All right. Are we are we good to go? Hello. Yes, exactly. Uh, I made my warnings uh, today. Campus will take us through the uh, similarities and differences between the use of queries versus parameters in the uh, in the Power BI service. Can thanks a lot for joining us. I think everybody knows you. Uh, to keep everything short, I'm handing over to you. All right, fair enough. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm not sure everybody knows me, but uh, I'll give you the, uh, the the brief, and I'm going to go through this really quickly here today because uh, I have a lot of material, and I want to try and get as much of this done uh, as close to an hour as I can. I'm afraid I might go a bit over, particularly for Q&A. Uh, so as we go along, if there are questions that are happening, just fire them into the chat window. I do have teams open on the right-hand side, so I will be watching for that. Um, so you know, if uh, questions come up, fire them in as, as we're going along. Uh, so if you don't know me, uh, I am a, a chartered professional accountant based in Canada. I run a website called xlguru.ca. I'm also one of the founding partners of skillwave.training, which is a platform that is dedicated to helping people learn how to use Power Query, Power BI, Power Pivot, uh, Excel, all those kind of good business intelligence tools. Uh, myself and Matt Allington, another uh, MVP, uh, run that site, and we're super proud of the work we do there and hope that you'll uh, you'll check it out. As a matter of fact, right now there's even stuff that's on sale there for 15% off, so it's a great time to, to jump in and, and check out our offerings. Uh, I am a Microsoft MVP. I've been awarded every single year since 2006 in a variety of categories from Excel to data platform that looks after Power BI. Uh, since 2019, I'm back in the uh, Microsoft 365 slash Office apps and services. And I'm also a software developer and an author. I write an add-in called Monkey Tools, which is an add-in for Excel to work with Power Query and Power Pivot. We can also connect to Power BI models, import Power BI models to Excel, which most people can't do, uh, as well as sort of audit your models as well. And of course, um, you may be familiar with my book as well. Uh, my first version of this book was M is for Data Monkey. The new, updated, expanded, completely rewritten version is Master Your Data for Excel and Power BI. Um, if you enjoy my stuff, you like free stuff, you want to sample what I do, uh, I do have a uh, SkillWave YouTube channel. And on that, every week we post uh, videos called Monkey Shorts. These are less than three minutes of technical content. Today's uh, video was on accessing Power Query documentation part two. I believe we've got about, oh man, there's 30 of these. I'm doing this weekly now. So if you're interested, you can check this out. I will be providing a link to the slides uh, again at the end of the session as well. So you can download us and get all the, the links from here as well. Um, all right. Now, before we dive in here, I'm going to do something quickly. I'm just going to turn off my camera. I want to make sure that as we're going through this, I'm dedicating as much bandwidth as possible uh, to, to the actual presentation itself. Um, and before we jump into the actual material itself, what I want to do is I want to first I want to get rid of this toolbar. Um, I want to just define some terms around working with our um, with our individual items here. So how the heck did I get to this screen all of a sudden? That's not the one I want to be on. Hold on one second here. Let me just go back. I've got a little mistake going on in my stuff, so I'm going to go and share this one. There we go. Um, so let's talk about uh, some definitions of things, um, because when we talk about queries and parameters, it's helpful to understand what is what. So for me, a query is anything that reads from an external data source. If you're connecting to an external data source, it's going to be a query. This could return a Power Query value. It could be a table, could be a list, could be a date, could be anything, okay? But the big thing here is that if it connects to an external data source, it is gonna be a query. If it can, um, then I'm gonna wanna talk a little bit about this term called scalar queries. And what a scalar query is, is, is any query which returns a single primitive value. That means a date, a number, or a text string, okay? Just one single value. It can be driven from any query, which means that you can actually go and connect to a data source and drill it all the way down to a scalar value, that's fine. You can reference another query and then drill it down to a scalar value, that's fine. The big key thing here with a scalar query is that it returns a single piece of primitive value, whether it's a date, a number, text, or something like that. The big thing to recognize here is that if you have a list 
or a table or a record as your output. That is not what I consider a scalar value. Those are what I consider structured values because they're more complex, they have more metadata. So that's the big difference between what we end up working with here, okay? So query can connect to an external data source. A scalar query drills down to a single data point. So one more term I wanna throw out here though, and that is a simple query. What is a simple query? A simple query is a single step query that returns a scalar value. This query has one step and it never reads from an external data source. It is basically a hard coded value, okay? And this is a very, very big and important distinction because when you're working with some of these components, you need to know whether or not you can use a scalar query or a simple query in place of certain things. So this is gonna come up as we go through this presentation today. When I talk about parameters, my parameters are actually, I have a different definition for these between Power BI and Excel. So in Power BI, a parameter is created via the parameters dialog box inside the Power Query editor. Right? It's pretty simple. It's called a parameter, it's a parameter. There you go. In Excel though, I have a slightly different definition for this. In Excel, I refer to any scalar value that's intended to drive other queries or filters as a parameter. If I'm using the actual parameter functionality inside Excel, I will refer to that as a official parameter in quotes there, um, but I will always preface it that way. When I'm talking about it, it's gonna be a parameter or it's gonna be an official parameter. Now, the reason why this is important is because if you know my work, if you go back to Emma's for Data Monkey, even what I was blogging previously to that, I actually have a specific function that was being used in Excel since before Power BI even existed, which was called get parameter. That function predates Power Query parameters. I invented mine first, but it actually returns scalar values, not parameters. And then the Power Query team came along and invented this concept of parameters that were different, okay? Uh, in Excel today, I still use scalar queries in lieu of parameters as I just find that they're more functional for the way that Excel actually works. If I look at parameters inside Power Query, it very much seems to me like these were built with Power BI in mind much more than Excel. In fact, the fact that they were deployed to Power BI and crystallized, and this is sort of the way that Power Query worked, is it debuted new features into Power BI, let Power BI users kick the tire on them, and then when it finally said, okay, we're gonna release them to general production, we'll take them to Excel, they showed up in Excel, and as far as I'm concerned, they weren't useful. And this is a big issue, actually, I think today, still with the way that Power Query gets developed and pushed into, I mean, Power BI gets to actually kick the tires on all these things and, and uh, set the functionality before it comes to Excel, which works differently, which is actually not good. So any rate, today's uh, presentation is going to be in Power BI Desktop and Power BI Service. Uh, I will call out, though, the differences for Excel as we go along, because, of course, Power Query exists in both places. Uh, I'm going to show two demo cases today. Um, the part that we're going to be going through here is that they are going to include a mix of both queries and parameters as we go through, and they're going to be showing two main scenarios. The first one is we're going to be looking at a dev versus production switch. Uh, and the reality for this is because no one likes waiting for refreshes when they're actually developing stuff. Uh, we want to work with smaller data sets when we're developing so that we don't have to wait for Power Query to reload massive previews. So I'm going to show you a way that we can actually use parameters and queries to switch quickly between these two things so that we can develop with a smaller data set and then switch it once we actually publish it. The other sample that I'm going to build up here is I'm gonna build a Fiscal Friday calendar. Now, this is a very um, specific type of calendar. There's so many out there, obviously. The month is gonna end on the final Friday of every month. The year ends on the Friday, final Friday of the calendar year. Uh, the challenge is this leads to an inconsistent number of weeks per month, a different year end every year. Uh, it's a very tricky calendar to, uh, to build. Um, I'm gonna create a query to do it, which we're gonna turn into a function. Full disclosure though, in order to try and keep this presentation as close to an hour as possible, I'm not really gonna be focused on explaining why I'm doing the things I'm doing with the calendar. I'm gonna be explaining why I'm doing the things with the queries and the parameters around this. So the actual logic of the calendar, you'll be able to watch back on the video later and slow it down, but I'm not gonna be pausing. I'll call out some things, but I'm not gonna be pausing and explaining the entire logic of why I'm using specific columns in specific places. All right, again, in the name of trying to get through all this stuff in uh, in as close to an hour as possible, we're going to jump straight into a demo, and I'm going to uh, switch across here to uh, Power BI Desktop. So 
In the download files that are provided with this, I'm actually providing you with a PBIT file for this. Uh, you'll need to follow the steps in the readme.txt file in order to get it to work for your SharePoint site. Okay, so again, when we get to the end, you'll have the link where you can download all of this stuff here. Uh, but for right now, we have a, a blank canvas. There's, uh, there's no fields uh, at all inside this thing yet, but I do have a little bit of query work that I've done up front here. So the things that you'll notice uh, right up front here, I have a, an official parameter right here called file path. And we can see that if I click manage parameter, it is a file path. It's got a little bit of text in there for description required, and it's got the link to my SharePoint site where I store a couple of different files. I have this Excel file called dev. Okay, so this is stored on SharePoint. It is this chits, which is basically transactions from food and beverage. And these are just the December 2013 transactions. I also have a production file, which is all of them. The big difference here, this file contains about 1,500 records. This one contains about 350,000 records. So if I'm developing a solution, I obviously want to be using this file. Okay, and now these are queries. Notice they're scalar and they are simple. There is just a single step and it returns a hard-coded value. Okay. Meanwhile, over here, I have a couple of queries. In this query, you'll notice it's got multiple steps. The first source is to go and connect to the web contents for the file path, which is our parameter, and pick up the actual name of the dev file, which of course was chits 2013-12. This returns our 1500 record set, although of course Power Query limits it to a thousand rows. Meanwhile, I also have a chits production. This one connects to the data set that has 350,000 rows. The big difference, I'm referring to a different piece here. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about this, file path is a parameter. File prod is a query. So we can, it's a scalar query. So we can combine those two things together to make a more complex query that has multiple steps that talks to a data source. Okay, so these things can be mixed and matched. And that's kind of an important thing too. Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to build something that very quickly switches between these two things when I make a change to a parameter. And I don't actually have that parameter yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and create myself a new parameter. So we're going to go manage parameters, new parameter here. And I'm going to create myself a new parameter right now, which I'm going to call a uh, data file. And for this data file here, I'm just going to put a nice little description in here. Uh, you should always fill out descriptions, folks, even if you don't, because descriptions are important for later. Uh, so we're going to say, what would you like to use, uh, dev or prod? And this is going to be interesting because I've actually given you the options for what I want you to select here. Okay, so this is kind of an important uh, um, important thing to uh, to be aware of here. So uh, I'm going to make it required, and I'm going to change the type to text. Uh, and I'm going to set my su suggested values to a list of values. I'm going to give you those two values, dev and prod. I'm going to set my default to be dev, and I'm going to set my current value to be dev as well, just because. Now, you could change these, obviously, um, to whatever you like. But for, for me right now, I'm going to go with those. What's interesting to me about this is I'm providing a list. So why the heck do I need to go and specify the same options in this description. And this will show up near the very end of the demo today as to why this is actually important because it is important to have these here. So we're gonna say, okay, and that's gonna create me a new data file parameter. I'm just gonna move that up here. And you'll notice that I can very quickly switch between dev and prod using little dropdown. So that's cool. So now I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna go and right click on chits dev. We're gonna reference it. And I'm gonna make a new query here, and I'm just gonna call this one here staging-chits. Uh, yep, that'll work, all right. And this is gonna be one of my staging queries. But the thing is right now, of course, it's calling directly from chits dev. I need this to be switchable. So because it's a staging query, I'm just gonna disable the load on this, and then I'm gonna modify this one a little bit, and I'm gonna say if data file, which is the parameter, equals dev, then we're going to use chits dev, else we're going to use chits prod. All right. So this is the big thing that, that needed to happen here. So here's what I want you to notice. Our development file is December 13, 2013 dates. If I now go back to my dev and switch it to prod and come over and look at my chits, 
I'm now looking at 2009 dates because I've got the entire setup. There's some 2013s in here as well. But it's very, very easy at this point in time to switch back and forth between my two files that I'm actually working with. Okay, so a nice little uh, parameter here with a little drop down list and a little if statement makes a huge world of difference in this case. And I'm going to show you later, once I publish this, how we can actually make that same change in the Power BI service once we've actually published something. Because I can do all my development work on the dev side here and then publish it and then switch it to prod in the Power BI service alone. All right. Now, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm very quickly going to spin up a data model off of this thing here. So I've got my staging table. It's a flat table right now. So I'm going to make some new queries. Uh, we're going to go right click and reference this one. This first one is going to be called items. And in the items table, I am going to grab my item and my category columns, and I'm gonna right click and remove other columns. I'm gonna grab my items right here, and I'm gonna remove duplicates from it. There we go, that looks good. And then I'm going to press control A to select all my columns, go to transform and detect my data types. Awesome, there we go. That's the fastest way I know to set multiple data types and actually was one of the things that I featured in a monkey shorts a little while ago. Uh, so let's do another one. I'm going to go reference my staging chits table again. I'm going to build another dimension off of this. So this is going to be my chit IDs. That's going to be this guy here. Right click, remove other columns. Right click, remove duplicates, and set the data type. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, that for every table that I'm actually doing that's going to go into my data model, the last step that I do is reset the data types for every single column. That is just the best practice when you're working with this stuff to make sure that nothing goes sideways because you don't want to have Power BI or Power Pivot if you're in Excel um, making choices about what your data type should be because sometimes it gets them wrong and that's not cool. Uh, okay, this is going to be my fact table now. We're going to do chits. So I'm going to reference staging chits and uh, I'm going to remove the category because I can link that from my items table. So uh, the way I prefer to do this is I'm not going to delete this column. Instead, I'm going to go grab all the ones I want to keep and choose remove other columns. That way I get the gear icon in case I want to change anything in future. If you just select the column and press delete, you don't. So this is just a nice little easy way to do it. Alternately, if you prefer, you can always go up to the uh, choose columns button here, and this gives you the same piece here. We can just uncheck the ones you don't want. So there's a little pro tip for you there. Uh, okay, so we've got those guys. Uh, yes, I need to take my units and my amount. I'm going to go add column. I'm going to add a multiply here, and I'm just going to change this to sales dollars. There we go. And then once again, control A, transform detect data type to lock all those data types in. Brilliant. So there we go. These three queries here are my data model queries. So I'll just move them into my data model folder here. Uh, folders are not important beyond the fact that I just like them because they keep me organized in the grand scheme of things here. Um, I don't know if my uh, good friend uh, Christian is here. Uh, I don't see him in the list right now, but Christian would probably point out that, Ken, this is very strange. You're doing things upside down because normally you have your data model folder at the top and all of your raw data at the bottom. And yes, I do. But for some reason, Power BI likes to keep moving my folders around and it drives me crazy. So, you know, that's what it is. But uh, for me personally, I build my data like a tree. The roots are the data and the data model are the leaves and those go at the top. So I would normally have all this guy right up the top here. I would put my parameters way down the bottom and my raw data right down in here somewhere. And that's the way I like to see the flow of the stuff that I have built. Okay, data models built, although not loaded. Now what I need is I need one more dimension. I need to create myself a calendar table. Very, very important. And I do not use DAX for this unless I am being tortured. Um, I always use Power Query. It's, it's just that what I think is the better practice for dealing with this. So I'm gonna create a, uh, a new query here right now. Um, we're gonna create some scalar queries. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by right clicking and saying new query, blank query. These are gonna be simple queries. The first one is gonna be called start date underscore P, okay, for parameter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up into the formula bar and I'm going to type in 2021-0101. Okay, so once I do this and hit enter, what I want you to notice is that the icon on this changes. It was ABC. It's now looking like a little calendar table. The important thing is you must use the date format that resonates with the control panel on your system. I use ISO dates because those are what dates should look like. Okay, year, month, day. So that's start date P. 
I'm going to do another one. New query, blank query. And we're going to go and just rename this. This one here is going to be end date underscore p for parameter again. Even though it's not a parameter, this is a scalar simple query. Uh, 2021, 1231. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. What I've done is I've created myself January 1st of a given year, December 31st of a given year as scalar simple queries. Okay. What am I going to do now? What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a calendar that spans between these two things. New query, blank query. We're going to start with one of my favorite date patterns of all time. So we're going to build a list and it's going to start with int 64. That is a whole number from my start date P up to int 64.from. Again, a whole number up to end date P. Okay, so this is the calendar pattern. And it builds a beautiful list that looks like this, which we're going to turn into a table and click OK as fast as possible. And then we're going to change the first column to be date. And we're going to change this to be a date type. So what's happened here is we've converted our dates into whole numbers. And we've built a list of numbers that go from one to the next whole number all the way to the end with a granularity of one in between. Then we convert it into a date because those are date serial numbers. So there we go. We've now got this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding some stuff to this. I'm going to go add date year year. We're going to go back to date and say add date. Uh, we're going to go and add the uh, month. We're going to go back to date again, and we're going to go to day and insert the name of day. Now remember, <coughs> the calendar that I'm building here is a fiscal Friday calendar. So everything ends on Fridays. So I'm just going to go and filter this down to say only show me Fridays. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my year and my month, transform, and I'm going to group them. And on this, I'm going to pick up the max, and this is going to be the max of date. And this one here, what we're going to do is we're going to call this end of month. We're going to add another aggregation right here, which is going to be account rows, and that is going to be called weeks in month. Again, as I promised, I'm not going to explain all the logic of exactly what I'm doing here because the point really is about the parameters and queries, which are going to come up later. But trust me, this is sort of the pattern that I need to go to uh, to build this stuff through. Uh, I'm going to add a couple more columns into this. So I've got my number of weeks and month. I've got my end of month. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to build myself a new column here for start of month. And this one is going to use a nice little formula, which is date dot add days open parenthesis. We're going to use the end of month. And we're going to do this. We're going to go with minus seven times the weeks in month. And then just to get the number right, we're going to add one. All right. I oh, love it when you hit enter. I wanted to say OK, but there we go. So this gives me my start of month. This gives me the end of the month. So I'm good there. I now need my start of year and end of year. So let me just go and build these. Actually, I can do this with a conditional column dialog. So let's do that. So we'll go and make this one called start of year. And the start of year is going to say if the month equals one, then I love this thing. Right here, we can change our ABCs to select a column. And from the column, what I can do is for my start of year, I'm going to pick up the start of month, otherwise null. I'll say OK and fill down. Remember, because we've checked if the month is one, if we happen to have two years here, it would actually interrupt this. It would have another date here, so it wouldn't fill into the wrong year. So that's important. Oh, actually, let me go back again. Conditional column. I'm going to do the same thing, but in reverse. So this one here is going to be end of year. What we're going to do is we're going to check if the month this time equals 12, then, and again, I love this feature. This is important why I'm actually calling this out right now. Notice we can select a column or we can select a parameter. There's one, one feature missing, but we'll talk about that later. So we're going to grab the end of month, if in the case that our month end equals 12, otherwise, no. And now we are going to fill up. There we go. So we got our start of year. We got our end of year. Again, remember, it's based on the Fiscal Friday calendar. This one just happens to end on December 31st, 2021. Now, the problem is I need every single date from start to finish on this thing. So now what I need to do is I need to actually go back and add myself a new date column. So here we go. We're going to go date, and we're going to use the famous little calendar pattern again. 
int64.from, and this one is going to go from the start of month, because these are looking at months, put space in there, up to the int, we'll get three dots there, that won't work, int64.from, and end of month. And close our little braces off. We'll say OK. I've now got a list that I can expand to new rows, which gives me all my individual days that I can change to my dates. And boom, there we go. What I've now done is I've taken every one of my month ends that I had in here, and I've got the days that are running through. So I've recreated my date column that I need for this. Now, what I'm going to do next is totally unnecessary. It's just one of those things that I like to do because it helps me read things later on when I'm looking at things. So I'm going to reorder my columns. Of course, the data model does not care what order your columns are in at all. As I say, this is just for me as a developer to be able to read it later and make sure that I've got everything that I need. So I'm going to reorder this to put my date in here. We're going to go date, year, month, weeks in month is going to be next. And I prefer to have my start of month, end of month, start of year, end of year. Last thing I'm going to do, select a column, control A, transform, detect data types. OK. This is my fiscal Friday calendar template. So I'm just going to go and call this one sample calendar. Again, the point of it wasn't really to explain how this part worked. But what I want you to recognize is what I've actually done here. What I started with is I had two scalar simple queries here. The calendar runs from those two queries. So if I change the dates on either of these, the sample calendar will expand to cover all of those particular components. Okay? And it goes and does the logic that it needs to do in order to come back. So the big thing that I want to do here is I want to be able to take this and find out what are the earliest and latest dates in my data and then apply this to this pattern to that. The challenge is right now, of course, I have hard-coded dates in here. So what I really want to do right now is I want to actually turn this into a function. But before I do that, let me just go and uh, and make a couple little changes here because I certainly don't want to load any of these to the data model. So let me go and disable the load. And I'm going to move all three of these things down into my parameters folder because that's where they should be living. They're not raw data per se. OK, now here's what we're going to do. I want to convert my nice little sample here into a function. So I'm gonna go right click, and I see this, this handy little create function button. I'm like, awesome. So I click it, and it comes back and says, no parameters are found. I'll still do this for you, but are you sure? Because it doesn't have any parameters. Now I believe in Excel, this is actually grayed out. It won't even let you do that, which I'm not sure which is better, to be honest with you, because if you really want a function to work, generally you're gonna want parameters in it. So this is probably more flexible, and yet still a little bit strange. In my world, I treat queries as parameters. So this is a little bit unfair. I am going, well, hey, no, I mean, I might have driven it from somewhere. I want to make this happen. But unfortunately, this is not the way it works in Power BI. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to say, all right, instead of using startdate.p and enddate.p as queries, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these into official parameters. So we can do that by selecting start date p right clicking on it and choosing convert to parameter now i'm going to be completely honest with you when i went through this presentation i'm going to do the same thing here for for end date p as well when i went through this presentation and was building this i had to do a bunch of research search to figure out how the heck do you get this stupid convert to parameter button to actually light up and this just speaks a lot to the way that i actually build my queries and, and whatnot because most of the time, this button is grayed out. Why? Why did it work for start date P and end, up, end date P? And the answer to that is because in order to convert something to a parameter, the query must be a simple query. One step does not connect to an external data source, returns a scalar value. If all three of those things are true, then at that point in time, you can right click and convert it to a parameter. Why do you want this to be a parameter and not a query? Well, because now when we go back to sample calendar, if we look at source, nothing's changed, right? It's still going from start date P and end date P. The only difference is these are now official parameters. But when we go to create function, 
notice that it says, hey, what do you want for a new name? And it recognizes the parameters start date P and end date P. So I'm going to go into this one here and I'm going to call this FXFF calendar because it's a fiscal Friday calendar. And at this point, I can say OK. And what will happen is it groups all of the stuff that's being used together. And I've now got my sample calendar and my FXFF calendar. Why do you want to do this? It's very simple. I can now come back and make a modification to sample calendar and any modifications that I make will get rolled into this one. Okay, so if I reorder the columns or anything like that, it's going to actually show up in my FF or FXFF calendar. All right, now. So what we're going to do with uh, with this one here is um, I'm going to go through now and I'm actually going to leverage this to go and build what I actually need for my data model here. So uh, in order to do that, I actually wanted to do something like this. I wanted to come over to this guy here and I want to just go and, you know, check a couple of boxes here. Show me where my uh, my start date and my end date are here and invoke this thing. But you'll notice that under my start date P here, I've got nothing. And under end date P, there's no drop down. There's nothing for me to be able to use in this particular case. So I need to figure out what am I going to feed into these two things in order to actually build my calendar. I don't want to fill in start date P and end date P because both of these are hard coded values. They're not dynamic to my data set. So I need to go back and actually generate something that is dynamic. And this is actually one of those things that I really struggled with. Uh, I mean, my my first programming language that I really sort of you know got into was um, was VBA. I, I'm a programmer in VB.net and C Sharp and whatnot. And when you're working with something that is a variable, you have to assign it a value. When I looked at this, I felt like it, I assigned it a value, but then I wanted to assign it a value dynamically. And I really struggled with this concept. One of the things that you need to realize about parameters when you're working with them is this parameter value that you see is just a placeholder. It gets replaced at runtime and you don't really need to do anything with it. You just got to feed it a column from somewhere generally in order to make it work. So let's see if we can actually create ourselves a value in order to figure out what we need. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back to my staging chits table because this has got the data that smart switches between development and production, and it has a date column in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right click on this and I'm going to reference it. And I'm going to make myself a new query here, and this one is going to be called start date underscore Q. The difference between start date P and start date Q is that start date P is for parameter and Q is for query. We're going to leave this one as a query and we're going to create a scalar query. I'm going to move this down into my parameters folder as well, even though it's not a true parameter. So what am I going to do with this one? I'm going to right click on date. I'm going to remove other columns. I'm going to filter this one here for a date filter is earliest. And I'm going to right click, remove duplicates. I'm going to take this data, transform it to be date, year, start of year. This is probably the oddest step. Even though it's already a date, I'm going to reset it to be a date. That makes sure that the next step of this pattern always works. If you don't do that, sometimes it hard codes the actual date when you do what I'm about to do. And that is right click on the actual data point itself and drill down. All right, what I now have is I have, by my definition, a scalar query. Remember, a scalar query is different than a simple query. A simple query is one line and cannot connect to an external data source. A scalar query can have multiple steps, which this does, can connect to an external data source, which by virtue of going through staging chits, it does, and drills down to a single scalar data point. Okay, so this is a scalar query, one textual item, but not hard coded. I'm going to get my end date as well. Right click, reference. Just going to disable the load on this. We'll call this one end date underscore Q. We bring it down in here to keep things organized. These are sort of all the queries that you know drive the solution that I don't want anybody messing around with. Is what, why I'm really collecting them here. Uh, I'm now going to go right click, remove other columns. This one we're going to filter to date filters is latest. Right click, remove duplicates. Even though this is the end of the year, 
I am going to transform it, date, year, end of year, because next year it might not be. Set it to a date, right click and drill down. All right. So big difference. Again, hard coded parameter. Notice that my start date, January 1st, 2021. Start date Q, January 1st, 2013, because that's what the data file is. So it's not 2021 anymore, okay? End date Q, December 31st, 2013. End date P, the parameter, is a 2021 year. Why this is important is because I use these to build up my sample calendar. So everything in here is all about 2020 through. And 2020, because it's fiscal Friday, we have to back some of this up. Okay, so, um, oh, Halil, you just threw something in for a slightly different but similar approach to calendar tables. I'm going to have to go and actually read that one there. That, that, that'll be interesting. I'm curious if you do something exactly. different. You, you can use Google Translate, but exactly, almost exactly the same approach. I bet you if I can get the M code, I probably won't even need to run the translate. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, awesome. Uh, so here we go. So basically the, the big thing here is that remember sample calendar is built off of these guys here. And this is, as I say, where I really struggled is I'm going, how do I match this to get it into my parameter to drive the calendar? You don't. And that's the big part that I really struggled with to begin with, because what we do is we say, all right, let's go to FF calendar and let's invoke it. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't have a drop down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and type in start date underscore Q, and I'm going to put in end date underscore Q. Fantastic. That should work, right? Invoke. Oh. Now, if there's one thing I love in Power Query, it's getting a yellow error message because I usually find these fairly cryptic. Um, we couldn't convert to number. Well, okay, well, what does that mean? So the issue is with this, and this is one of those things that actually frustrates me a lot around this stuff, is that inside this, there's no dialogue here that will actually allow you to say, it, there should be a drop down right here that says, allow me to feed in any A parameter or B, any scalar query. Those should have a drop down there, or it should give me the ability to put in a textual value or a number value or something like that. But there should be a drop down that allows me to select from scalar queries. It's not like Power Query doesn't know what scalar queries exist in this. It's put icons on them. They know. So why is it not here? And I'm going to ask you guys to vote on something a little bit later for this. So at any rate, we can come back. We can fix this. The big deal is when you put something in there, what Power Query always does is it wraps it in quotes. So I'm just going to go and take these quotes off. Because now, or, you know, the other alternative, of course, is I could have written this and just said equals FX calendar and, and put these in. Let me just put some spaces around here. Totally unnecessary, but I like the breathing room. Uh, there we go. And now if I hit enter, what you'll notice is that we get our calendar. The big part here that's important is notice that our date start 2020 12. Again, this is a fiscal calendar. So this is our fiscal Friday calendar. So even if we've got January 1st, the first week of the year actually starts here on December 29th, and it will run through all of our 2013 dates based on what's in start date Q and end date Q. Okay, so this is pretty cool. This is now my calendar. Oops, let's try and spell that correctly. Calendar. Really having spelling challenges this morning. Uh, there we are. So I'm going to move that up here. One final thing I want to do to this, I mentioned this once before, I'm going to do it again. Even though my sample calendar and my function by its virtue, by virtue of the fact that they're the same, even though they connect or set the data types, I'm going to do it again here because this query loads to the data model. So it is important to make sure that we always hard code those data types at the end, just in case anything changes in the pattern and things go sideways. Okay. Now, um, I want to show you just a, a quick little diversion here on, on something. Um, all of our parameters right now have been manually typed, uh, but one of the things that's kind of, so as we put them into things, I've, I've typed them manually into different cells. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to the chits table for a second here. I'm not going to apply this, but I want to show you uh, some of the things that are actually kind of interesting and, and cool on this one here. So if I go to my date filters and go to date filters here, um, I can go and say, give me a date filter that says after. And it says, no problem. You want to say when your dates are after. And if I go and type something and I can click and drop down, it'll give me a bunch of values here. Of course, I can ob obviously go and choose a specific date. But on the left-hand side here, I have a little drop down that says, you've got to use something that returns a date. That's why it's using this icon. Now, if I hit the drop down, it says, would you like to type in a date? 
would you like to use a parameter? Well, as it happens, I have a couple of those, start date P, end date P, but we already know these are hard-coded values. There's no reason that I would want to use these parameters. Where's the option for scalar query? Because I want to use these ones, but they're not in this drop-down list, and they absolutely should be. Can you filter to an actual query itself? Yes, you can. I'm going to do this and I'll delete the step. So let's go with start date P. Okay. Can we do this? Sure, you can. All you need to do is just go in and say, instead of using start date P, I'm going to use start date Q. So queries are acceptable, but unfortunately, they don't show up in that drop down dialog. And they absolutely should. Because again, it's not like Power Query doesn't know that we have scalar data types or scalar queries which match the desired data types. Okay, so that's a big challenge that I see around these things. So I'm going to delete that because I don't actually want that in there, but it is something that uh, that I want to point out as, as one of the things that's actually uh, uh, a shortcoming, I think, in, in this. And this happens in both Excel and in Power BI because it is a Power Query thing. All right, everything's built. We've mixed up our queries. We've mixed up our parameters here. I'm going to go to Home, Close and Apply. I'm going to go and load this again. Remember, this is all built on the dev data set. So 1500 rows, even though it's coming from a SharePoint file, I would not want to be bringing 350,000 rows from SharePoint back to my local desktop because that just takes too long, especially when you've got a Teams meeting running and consuming all the bandwidth. Uh, so there we go. We've got our tables. Let me just go and check that my data model has been set up correctly. I love that Power BI gets most of this right, but then sort of misses kind of your key part. Just doesn't like my date table for some reason. Let me just go and hide these from the model, hide and report view, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna break one of my cardinal rules here, folks. I'm gonna use implicit measures for things. I would never normally do that, but in the interest of time. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and create ourselves a nice um, clustered bar chart here. Uh, I'm gonna go to my items table and put category on there. And then I'm gonna go to my chits table. And I think I'm gonna throw my units onto this as well. So there we go. We get a nice little bar chart that shows some of the stuff that we have. And we're gonna go build a line chart as well. Make that a little bit wider. And on our line charts, I'm gonna go to my calendar. I'm gonna put end of month on there and I'm gonna put units on there as well. And this might look a little bit weird, but we're using end of month and the dev file only has one month of data. And that's why we have a single data point for our line chart. Okay, so this is actually correct what you're seeing here. So what I'm gonna do for this right now is I'm gonna go and say file and I'm gonna save it. Oops, I didn't wanna save that one. I guess I'll have to undo that later, whatever, it'll work. And uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna publish this right now. And let me publish this to my demo data sets. So here we go, we're gonna hit publish. And I'm just gonna wait for this to publish to Power BI. And now we're gonna go and look at what our parameters do when we're playing around with Power BI. So I'm gonna go and open this in powerbi.com. Do, 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 here we go, there we are. Okay, so here's our report. This again is all dev data. So I wanna switch this out so it's using production. So I'm going to go and open this up here. I'm going to go and take a look at my settings on this. So we'll go into settings and we're going to go take a look at the data source credentials here. And it looks like my credentials are actually good there. So that's good. Must be because I published something yesterday. Now, here are where we can set all of the parameters. Okay, so notice that we've got our data file parameter. This is the official parameter we created. We've got end date P, that was the parameter version. We got start date P. We don't have queues because those ones were queries, not parameters. And file path that I had was the original parameter as well. What I wanna do is I wanna change my dev from dev to production. Now, if you recall, when we were in Power BI Desktop, there was a nice little dropdown right here that said, let me use the list that you've provided and I'll tell you what your options are. Notice when I click in this, there is no drop down here. Remember how I said we have to write everything in the description to tell people what valid values are? This is why. And this is actually a big, uh, it's sad, actually, honest, let's be honest, because why isn't it set up? Because I could e very easily right now mess this up uh, and do something different. So anyway, I'm going to switch this to prod. We're going to say, OK. There we go. So that's changed now. And now I'm going to go back to my report here, and then I'm going to refresh now. Now, the data here is going to take a few minutes to refresh, 
So as I'm doing this, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm just going to show you another sort of uh, benefit of working with our uh, queries versus parameters. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open a Power BI template. And this is the one that I've actually shared with you. And I want to show you what actually happens with queries versus parameters when you open a Power BI template. Okay, so this file is basically the same one as we were working with uh, previously. And I just realized that I'm actually missing something. I need to go and uh, just grab a piece of text here really quickly. So let me just go and quickly scroll down to get to my text that I need to copy. All right, so what it does is for every parameter that is in the solution, it will prompt you to enter the value. And this again is why it's really important to enter something in your description as to what's going on here. And you'll notice I've got some description or some something here telling you, you need to read the readme to understand how to set up your data properly to use it. What is the file path that we're gonna put in? Well, I'm gonna paste in my SharePoint file path and then I'm gonna choose load. Now, what happens at this point? Nothing much, but if I go into transform data, what you'll notice is it's gonna load the parameter has been filled in, all of the queries have not changed. So you can see all of these guys here exist. And with the parameter completed, it can now go and actually pull the data in. Okay, so everything works nicely here. This is the only one that prompted because it's the only one that is an official parameter. This one here, if I don't fill that in, we get nothing, okay? But for anything that's a query, the data stays exactly as you have it. What I did is I took the begin file that I originally showed you and just saved this as a PBIT. And that's what actually causes this to clear. And I can actually show you the same thing if I go back and say, let me just close this, don't save it. Let me just reopen this entire file. So this again is gonna be coming from the PBIT. It's gonna prompt me, but what I'm gonna do with it now is I'm gonna say, hey, this is really cool and everything else, but I'm just gonna cancel. And what you'll see now is if I go into transform data, I got nothing. So if I don't fill in the parameters with something, it won't even bring me over the other queries and, and whatnot. So there's use cases for these things, as you might imagine, um, for, for filling in a parameter to prompt somebody with something. If they don't fill it in, it just collapses the file. They don't get anything. If they do fill it in correctly, that's when they're going to actually start seeing the other logic. Uh, but again, those queries are preserved. Okay. So uh, let me just go back over to Power BI and let's do a refresh on our file here and let's see. Ah, beautiful. All of our data came in. So we're back in the service right now. Remember, I switched from dev to prod. So I did all of my development work on desktop with a small data set that had 1,500 rows, brought it over here, typed the right thing in and hit to refresh my data set. And now I've actually got my production data showing up in the service. And I've obviously set my stuff up to default to dev. You could obviously go the other direction um, and default it to, to prod and then override it locally. Uh, but there you go. This is uh, one of the cool things around working with uh, working with the parameters. Um, Alejandro likes that. Awesome, cool, good stuff. Uh, all right. So let me um, let me just jump over to uh, back into uh, into my presentation. Let's just sort of recap this through here. Hey, look at this. I'm actually going to be coming in close on time uh, this time around, which is good. Uh, so let, let's take a, a quick look on um, all these things after we've seen them in action and talk about what the differences are here. So the big benefits to queries is that queries can be uh, dynamically driven from data. Right, that's the big thing. I love working with these things because I can, you know, take my date column that's in my fact table, drill it down to say remove all the other dates, filter it to the earliest date, change it to a year start or a year end, and drill down on it to get a scalar query. And then I can feed things with that. So queries are super awesome for that. You cannot do that with a parameter. At least you can hack it, but it's very fragile. So you really don't want to do that. Okay. Um, in Excel, you can update your queries directly from the Excel grid. You basically just fill it into an Excel cell and hit refresh and you're good to go. And that, that can actually be used to drive different queries and whatnot. Uh, in Power BI, not so much. In Power BI, you'd potentially use a parameter for that. Uh, the mechanics of a query are preserved on release. So whether you're using a Power BI template or whether you're using Excel, your query values will only change based on what you are, your logic actually does. So if you put in a simple query that has a hard-coded value, it's gonna be there every single time. If you've driven it dynamically by data, it will update and, and whatnot, but the mechanics of how it all works are preserved when you release the file. 
The drawbacks though. Well, there are some drawbacks for working with these things. Number one, the create function dialog is disabled if you are using a query. You must use a parameter in order to get it to hook up correctly. I don't anticipate that that is ever going to change. And honestly, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I've wrapped my head around it enough now, uh, but it is a little bit strange. But that if you ever try to deal with the create function dialog box and you don't see that ability in Excel or in Power BI, you're told that there's no parameters, this is why. The other thing is though that queries don't show in dialog dropdowns. And I, I called that out when we took our little sort of side thing. You can see that you can enter text or, or values, you can enter your parameters, you can create a new parameter, but you don't have the ability to actually use a scalar query in your dialog dropdowns. I would like your help in fixing that. So if you can do me a favor and go and, uh, and sign in and vote for this thing here, um, I actually, uh, emailed my uh, my friend uh, Miguel Escobar, who uh, is a or, or was my partner at uh, the Power Query Academy, uh, who is now working at Microsoft. And Miguel's response was, "Hey, can you uh, can you send out or put an idea on um, on PowerBI.com?" I said, "Or ideas.powerbi.com." So I said, "Sure." So he's watching this one. We need a heck of a lot more votes, folks. So if you agree with me that your scalar queries should show in your dialog dropdowns, you shouldn't have to convert them to static parameters. Please go vote for that. The uh, the link is in the chat. Um, all right, uh, parameters. What about parameters? Where are the benefits of those? Well, they show in every dialog dropdown. That's the first one. They enable the create function and they allow you to actually build your sample transform that automatically updates into the function when you're making changes. That is brilliant. You can update them directly from the Power BI interface. You cannot change a single scalar value query from the Power BI interface, from, from powerbi.com rather so. Now, that's both good and bad, right? There may be instances where you want to, but at the same time, if you're using a scalar query, it can also help protect it so users can't change it in the uh, in the Power BI um, dot com service. Okay. Uh, the other thing with parameters, I believe, let me just uh, confirm this one here really quickly. But if I go back to um, to my desktop right here, uh, I believe we have the ability inside here to go and edit our parameters right from Power BI right here. I don't even need to go into the Power Query editor. <clears throat> yeah, remember how I said that they didn't implement this stuff properly in Excel? In order for us to change parameters in Excel, we have to go into Power Query, lock ourselves out of Excel, and make the changes and then go back. It's just, just wrong. Somebody should write a software, like an add-in, like Monkey Tools or something like that, that does that <clears throat> maybe in the future. Uh, anyhow, that is something that is a little bit frustrating. Uh, parameters when you deploy a Power BI template are cleared and will prompt a user for entry. That does not happen in the Excel template so far as I'm aware, um, but uh, another good benefit for working with parameters. Drawbacks, dynamic values are difficult or fragile to do. If you actually go back and you look through my website, um, you'll find an article on how to actually make parameters dynamic. I did it because I was, as I say, I was really struggling with how these things work and was trying to populate these values. It worked, but it was so easy to break. And you did not want to be introducing something into your real world solutions that is very, very easy and very fragile, uh, or very easy to break, very fragile in, in the grand scheme of things. So I would advise you actually not to do this. Uh, the other side is, as I say, uh, Excel, you have to update things by Power Query. You can't do it directly from the Excel. Um, you can't update a, uh, a parameter from the Excel grid because they can't live in the Excel grid because that's a scalar query at that point. And you have to, we have nothing on our ribbon that allows you to actually change it without going into Power Query, which is a little bit frustrating. Actually, this kills me. It just drives me nuts. But hey, there you go. So when would you generally lean to scalar queries, for example? Dynamically driven values. You want the earliest or latest data point from your data set or your minimum max volume or a dynamic value for a filter? Scalar queries are brilliant. You can connect the data sources, drill them down, and once you've got that scalar piece, you can then hack your M code to get them in for dynamic filters uh, or for, for different components that you might use to drive a dynamic solution. A simple scalar query, constants, okay? In the case that I dealt with, we had instances of both of these. Start date Q and date Q were scalar queries. Are simple scalar queries file paths because the actual name of the data source file probably isn't going to change. It doesn't need to be driven dynamically. It just needs to be hard coded. But when we deploy our Power BI templates, we do not want these values to be wiped out. That is a perfect, perfect use case for a simple scalar query. Uh, organization level file paths or URLs, things like that. And remember, you can actually mix and match these when you put them together in your M code for driving things like file paths. So when would you use parameters? Driving custom functions. 
I mean, this is where they're brilliant, right? They allow that whole sample transform capability uh, in order to, to build it up. And you saw this in the fiscal Friday calendar. Uh, we use queries to easily, uh, um, or using queries prevented the easy creation of the custom function using parameters allowed it to happen. And the parameters allow us to actually set up a testing boundaries that get replaced at runtime. Items needing runtime control, dev prod flags, brilliant place for parameters. And as you saw, you can actually change those right inside the, uh, the Power BI.com user interface. Uh, data that users need to customize for their own solutions. Uh, this could be a file path, a user URL or a username. Those are, are good places. Now you'll notice that I got file paths on the left for simple scalar query too. Absolutely. You know that route to where your SharePoint URL is? Well, that one you might want to have as a simple scalar query. But the username that goes into what's going on there, that one might need to be a parameter because it may need to change and the user might need to put in what they need. The other thing is um, storing sensitive data. If you look at some of the Power BI templates that have actually been released, I mean, I know uh, Reed Havens does one uh, for um, Google Analytics and whatnot. Reed would never release a template that has hard-coded into the query his Google path. I mean, that makes no sense at all. So he'd want to use a parameter so that you get prompted for your API key or, or login authentication information, and you'd never see his, right? That's a, a fantastic use case for those ones as well. So if you've got sensitive data that you need to be wiping out before you release it to someone, that is a brilliant place to do these things too. Uh, let me give you some resources and then we'll go into uh, Q and A if there's any questions here. So if you're interested in learning about Power Query and all the sort of mechanics of all the different pieces that go into these things here, uh, I've got three resources that I can share you uh, or share with you. Um, the first one is uh, my Master Your Data Book. I mean, this is uh, this is the definitive guide for working with Power Query for uh, written by Excel and Power BI pros for Excel and Power BI pros. Uh, our Power Query Academy at Skillwave. Um, we actually have uh, what I believe is the most comprehensive Power Query training on the planet. I believe there's over 24 hours of video material now included in the Power Query Academy. Uh, we update this frequently. Um, I mean, there's lots of things I still want to update in there, but uh, we also add new content on a regular basis, which I know is a big hit with our uh, subscribers. Uh, and if you're interested, we also have a handy collection of Power Query recipe cards as well. You can find uh, the pricing on all of these things at skillwave.training slash shop. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, right now, everything is actually on sale until July 31 uh, for 15% off. So if you're interested in jumping into any of these things, you should, uh, should definitely take the plunge on that now is a great time. Uh, if you love the stuff that I do and you want to know more about where I am and what I'm doing, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. Um, you'll get uh, my four or four of my uh, free DIY business intelligence ebook series, my top five Excel, Power Query, Power Pivot, and, uh, and Power BI tips. Uh, I tell you about upcoming courses that I'm doing. You'd learn that I'm in Toronto uh, in a couple of weeks leading a live in-person self-service business intelligence bootcamp. Would love to see more people there. We've got a really small class right now. Um, so it's going to be a great learning opportunity. I'm also going to be in New Zealand in November doing it live again um, and whatnot. And then, you know, we tell you about all the other places that are coming up as well. Uh, we give you a monthly what's new for Excel, Office 365, and Power BI. I just released that actually today on our newsletter uh, for what's new this month. We tell you about new products, give you discounts, you know, all the standard newsletter stuff. If you're interested, you can sign up here, uh, although that link should be an HTTPS link. I need to fix that, but uh, that should still get you there. Uh, if you're interested in connecting with me, these are just some of the different areas where you can find me online. I am all over the place um, and I love to, uh, to connect with folks as well. Uh, and finally, I just want to end off on this slide here. So if you're interested in downloading all of the, uh, the stuff um, along the way here, uh, the, I, I, would, I would recommend, honestly, if you can try and hit that QR code, it's a heck of a lot easier than typing that. Um, but, uh, but there you go. That will get you to the, uh, to the resource and download uh, components for the files that we we're actually using today. So you can play along at home if you want to watch this back later once the, uh, the recording is posted. And that is, uh, that is what I have for my presentation for today. So I'm uh, going to come back on, uh, on camera here. Um, at least I'm going to try. If I, for some reason, my camera is not uh, wanting to let me turn it back on. I'm not sure why that is, you know, besides from the fact that it's, you know, Teams. But um, all right, well, maybe I won't turn my camera back on. I'm here. I'll still talk. So if there's any questions at all, uh, by all means, uh, folks, uh, fire them into the chat or um, by all means, you know, uh, raise your hand and, and we can come off and, uh, and ask these things in person. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to 
you know, give you my uh, my thoughts and uh, and opinions on this. So, um, fabulous presentation, all this. Uh, thanks, uh, Kathy. Appreciate it. Exactly that fellow oh. possession, Ken. Thanks. Got my <laughs> got my camera back. There we go. Excellent. Yeah, no, you're uh, you're very welcome. I, I hope that uh, I hope that people found this interesting. Um, like I say, there's places for both of these things. I uh, I very much use a mix uh, back and forth of both queries and parameters and things. The biggest parts where I love the parameters, though, honestly, is is building up those those custom functions, but still having the ability to actually to do a, a sample transform that writes back in. I just think that is so darn cool. Um, but you know, in often cases, as I say in the Excel world, I'll use my scalar queries to get things done, and I find it it works really really well there. So. Um, I can thanks see that. Can, uh, and, uh, yeah. Th thanks, thanks to you, I found a chance to promote my blog posts for the Turkish audience. <laughs> audience, we, <laughs> no, we awesome. are sharing very similar approach. There are some slight differences. I'm leaning more on parameters, but this session made me think that I need to reconsider them. Yeah, the parameters are great. The only problem is is the hard coding of it, right? So that's where I think the if you take the parameter. It's awesome for building the function, but then you want to populate it with that dynamic data. And at that point, you get a calendar that every time you hit refresh, it just expands to cover everything. And I mean, that's the brilliance part, right? Because I, I don't know about you, but um, I mean, before Power BI, I'm sure you did work with Excel. I mean, how many files did you find where you had to go and update at the end of every fiscal year and somebody always forgot to expand the calendar and everything blew up, right? So um, getting that, that dynamic into it is just, it's magic. I mean, it just, means you don't have to babysit it all the time, which is who wants to do that? So there you go. Um, awesome. Thank I see the kind comments coming in from the chat. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, cool. There we go. Hey, don't be shy. If you have questions, just unmute yourself and uh, ask Ken. Douglas, please do not type. Just ask directly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, feeling, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling that there's not too many questions right now, which means that either it was really clear or it blew everybody's exactly. mind. Or <laughs> first option. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not so totally sure on that. There was a lot of information in there, a lot to, uh, a lot to go and consume, and uh, you know, I'm sort of say, um, I'm, I'm glad uh, Hillel is going to be. Um, is going to be sharing the uh, the recording of the session. So if you do want to, uh, yes. you know, watch Thank it back and whatnot, um, I, th I think YouTube has the option to slow me down as well, doesn't it? I can't remember if you've got even <laughs> the ability to change the playback speed. It's always valuable. So, but uh, yeah, Kathy, you're right. It is a lot to digest. There's definitely no question there. There's lots of stuff going on, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, if there is no further questions, let me stop the recording here uh, because I need to ask something, uh, Ken. Maybe okay. that might be sort of a uh, request from me. Okay, no worries. But I need to stop.